bandwagon too. <laughs> no, my idea is this. I don't want to have to stop waiting for this to happen. I just want to know that this is going to happen. I want you to know that it's going to happen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. was redeemed, only beauty remained, and my orphan heart was given a name, my morning grew quiet as my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested and my life began. is over me you have made me new now life begins with you released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom you paid for the war Sold my dead and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was
Okay, I've got the thumbs up. We're ready to go here. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this lovely uh, Sunday morning. We are so grateful to have you with us here at Faith Lutheran in Forest Lake, Minnesota. I want to thank Arda Ryder for sponsoring our broadcast so that you can watch that on live stream or on Facebook Live today as uh, she's remembering her husband Tom uh, by uh, uh, sponsoring our broadcast. Uh, Today, one of the things I want to point out to you is just a Uh, You know, it's beautiful outside, but still chilly, so giving you some warm thoughts. We had our confirmation students on Wednesday uh, hear from our high school students who've been on the canoe trip in the past. And so all of these uh, former canoe trip alumni uh, came to tell them that experience and to try to get them excited about going on the canoe trip this July. A bunch of the students who went last year uh, have have said, hey, we want to go back again this year. So we're excited for that, getting you some some warm thoughts, thinking about that. Also really cool to see some of that leadership as that's carried through with our our high school students and and how they've been uh, seeing that role of recruiting to to say, hey, this was a great, memorable experience for us. We hope you can do that too. If you're also looking for a way, now I know a lot of folks might be going on uh, spring break trips and all sorts of things like that, but one of the things you could do is a personal retreat. And so I didn't know anything about this until Linda you gave me a little bit of a heads up about what personal retreat uh, opportunities there are. And so here we go. Oh, hey, Pastor John. What are you up to? Well, I, I've got about two minutes right now to get the wordle done before I've got to hop to my next meeting. And then I've got to get the kids somewhere. And I've just, my whole day is pretty much booked up. Yeah, that wordle is pretty amazing, yeah. right? So it sounds like you could use some space for quiet. Have you thought mm-hmm. about doing faith personal retreat? On February 12th. Okay, well, um, that sounds really interesting, but I've got such a busy schedule. Yeah, scheduling is so tricky, but that's kind of the point about doing this retreat, putting space away with God on your calendar. Okay, you said February 12th. Oh, uh, I can't do it that day. I'm, I'm, shoot. That's okay. You can schedule it on your time and do it with the resources that Deacon Nina provides. Hmm. Most of the retreat is by yourself anyway. By myself? Really? Well, that could work. Uh, But where am I going to be able to find six whole hours of quiet? (laughs) I can imagine. I'll bet you can find a cabin or book a space at a nearby monastery or retreat center. We have resources for that, too. A monastery? Hmm, That sounds pretty sweet. Uh, Do you know if they've got free coffee there? (laughs) Probably. And don't worry about what you'll do with your time. There will be wonderful resources for reflection. And the point is to take a break with God. Mm. So if you spend your time outside or playing music or sipping coffee, you're set up for a great prayerful experience. Wow. You know what, Linda? That sounds like something any of us could do. And I'm going to talk to Deacon Nina about that right now and find out some more. Sign up now for Time Away with your Creator by doing Faith's personal retreat in February. This retreat has no in-person components. You can do it anywhere. There are options available for different times, formats, and quiet locations. Register online or in the church office before February 6th. The cost is a simple $10 to $15 donation. I hope that you will join us. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Invite you to take a moment to share that peace with those around you or to uh, sh- give a shout out if you're uh, watching from home. Maybe send somebody a text to ser- uh, share that peace with them. So good morning, everybody. Please join us in singing God with us. Join as you are able. Shine brighter in us, O Emmanuel. 
to bear shame and to conquer the grave, O oh, Emmanuel, God with us, our Deliverer, you our Savior, in your presence we find our strength. We gather in worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. We pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we have our prayer lab minute for today. Many of us deal with the cold getting out in it and not letting it stop us. We still go out for a daily walk or we enjoy the beauty of creation by snowshoe or out on a ski trail. Even if you try to stay snuggled inside, sooner or later, you have to get out into the icy air, even if it's on your way to warmer climates. So as we face the crisp air of winter, whether joyfully or reluctantly, I invite you to pause for reflection on God's presence here.
Consider that God fills our lungs with the air we need. On days like these, we can be visually reminded of that provision by watching our breath. In Genesis, the breath or the wind of God hovered over the waters, anticipating the unfurling of creation itself. Ponder that here. The breath of God has just poured out of your very being, hovering before your face. In the cold air, take in a deep cleansing breath of God's love. Release that breath as possibility out into the world. Possibility of compassion, healing, hope, redemption, and joy. And watch that breath, that spirit of God before you. Allow yourself to imagine all the goodness that God is working in your life and out in the world. May the Spirit of God be upon you in these cold winter days. A reading from Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. A gospel reading from the fourth chapter of Luke. Please stand as you're able. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so they might throw him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. All right, you actually may be seated, but please join us in beautiful thing.
Grace and peace to you, my friends in faith. All right, I need you to do something for me. I need you to all fold your hands across your chest like this. I guess I, I need you to do this because I need to know what it, what it must have felt like for Jesus to stare back at, at the whole, uh, you know, the synagogue as they all, you can even put a grumpy face on. And, okay, so that's what it must have looked like for Jesus, okay? Uh, now I need you to do something else. Uh, take your arms, take them back down, and now do it the opposite. Put the opposite arm that you just did. Feels weird, doesn't it? Like you're not, like think about it. Like any time you fold your hands, you always probably do it the exact same way. And so to throw it off of, like if you're really uncomfortable right now, you can undo it. Um, So even though you at home, you can all undo it. It feels weird because it's a backwards thing. Like every time I fold my arms, I always do it this way. So to do it this way just feels a little unnatural. And it's this habit that I've formed. It's what I'm used to doing. I, I recently took a leadership course in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's been around for a long time, but this is from the Stephen Covey Foundation. Uh, I studied Covey when I was in college, and I don't want to tell you how long that's been. So, I mean, I, I knew a lot about this material when I took it, but it was a train-the-trainer course, so I'm able to teach these, uh, these habits. And it was a great leadership course for me to take because it was designed to reflect on the person. I saw how many different ways that this could also be applied to things that we do here in the church. And so thinking about how we cultivate better relationships with each other, how we become more effective in our own time, in our own self-growth. And so one of the takeaways that seemed very timely to me was how uh, the, the course talked about how we carry our own weather. And it's from that first habit of being proactive. Stephen Covey says, proactive people carry their own weather with them. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means we don't have control over the weather, but we do have control over our attitude about it. And then the instructor showed us these different circles. We have the outer circle, the circle of concern, where we don't necessarily have any control, and then we have that inner circle, the circle of influence, where we do have some control. And so on the outside, these are the external forces that we think about, but ultimately, we don't have very much, if any, control over. For example, as we talk about carrying your own weather, the weather, like, and let's be honest, here in Minnesota, we knew what we were getting into when we decided to live here, but that doesn't mean that that weather and, and things that go on, uh, whether it's going to be snow or cold or sun or whatever it is, we think about it and it influences our decisions and it's something that we might be worried about. And so you think about other things that are in that circle of concern that we don't necessarily have control over. For example, natural disasters, politics, the outcome for our favorite sports team. And so think about how that can affect our feelings, even though we don't have any control over it. But it also extends to things like COVID and genetics and illness. We don't have control, but we certainly wish we did. But on that inside is the circle of influence. This is what we do have a little bit of control over, like the way that we talk to others, what we put into our body, the the things that we do for our prayer and our spiritual practices. It's the circle in which our choices do have an effect on the outcomes. The instructor then offered a simple reminder on how our responses might affect us. And he said this, whatever you water grows. So think about that. Whatever we consume, whatever we put our mind to, or whatever we're thinking about the most, it's going to affect our external and our internal circles. We might make internal choices that affect our external attitude about things, whether that's the news that we consume or the people that we hang out with or the things that we dedicate our time to, that we spend time thinking about. Maybe these are activities that just aren't very fulfilling, but they're just kind of mindless and we keep doing them. You think about all of those internal choices that we make, the more that we do those, that can actually make that outer circle, that circle of concern, push down on us and potentially suffocate us. So what happens when we get controlled by that circle of concern and we spend all of our time kind of worrying and thinking about it? It becomes the one thing that we think about all the time. It creates fear and dread. It might even lead us to to have less trust for our other people, to be less likely to have a positive outlook on on our lives. So what about the things that we do have control over? And, And that's our circle of influence. That's where we have some control. The way that we think the way that we act, the attitudes that we have towards others can go a long way in influencing them. 
we actually have control over those responses. And so when we add water to those, when we add more time and more thought and more energy to it, that circle can actually grow and actually healthy things can happen, positive behaviors, healthy habits. Whether that's getting sleep or eating well or exercising, Maybe it's talking to somebody who can help you work through something, like a counselor or an expert, or maybe even talking to a trusted best friend to be able to, to, to find that healthy circle of influence so that as we water it, that that can grow. And when those habits really start getting developed and cultivated, that's where we build some resilience. And when we have a little bit more resilience, we're a lot better equipped for when that circle of concern does get really big and scary and, and might become crushing down on us. Because... Truth is, bad things do happen to us. Bad things happen in the world. The weather strikes. We may have an illness or loss. These are the things that we, that we experience. But the stronger we can be uh, and, and the stronger we've built up that circle of influence in our lives, the better equipped we are to face those events. Certainly none of us could have anticipated COVID, yet over time, have you noticed how you've kind of changed and, and maybe evolved and you're, you've understood how you have a little bit more of a circle of influence in your attitude and how you approach things, how we have some tools now that help us have some, some control and not be consumed by, by that. We have control with our response. So the course really wasn't specifically related to spirituality, but in my opinion, as I kept like, hearing these different ideas, the thing that I kept coming back to is thinking about how important spirituality is, how we spend time each week in prayer lab, because it's important that we've built up those tools of resilience to have that direct relationship with God, whether that's prayer or quiet or mindfulness, or just even think about our own stated theology, right? Our theology of loving our neighbor. That is something that we carry with us because that helps us in building our own circle of influence. And whatever we grow, or whatever we water, grows. It's true for me. I know that when I can find that circle of influence stronger in my life, it's when I'm more patient or when I'm more thoughtful. I'm more generous with my time and money when that's happening. I, I find that everything else just takes care of itself when I'm able to, to really think about that circle of influence. I water my circle of influence, and that means that when that's happening, I'm usually at a good place in my heart and in my head, and I'm right with God, and I'm right with my neighbor. But I, I can promise you I'm not always there. I, I notice that sometimes things might dry up a little bit. I notice that there's times where I might need a little adjustment or a course correction Maybe it's I need a little bit more sleep or I need to eat better. I need to exercise or get outside and just be able to take some time away. And thinking about how important that is that we have those tools and know how to, to be able to adjust. We think about how the life of Jesus, as we've learned here in the Gospels, is perhaps a timeless guide on leadership. Like Jesus is that leadership guru that is the best guru we could ever learn from because he truly understands how those external influences can also affect him. Think about how Jesus carried his own weather. He had all of these external forces kind of crashing down upon him. Like every time Jesus would open his mouth, he would make somebody else mad or he would do something that would, would create all sorts of havoc. And that circle of concern really could have consumed him. You mean, just thinking about this event that happens in his hometown of Nazareth. You know, so as, as we hear about in Luke's gospel, Jesus' ministry is all about going to these different synagogues and all of these villages. And, you know, like, people have heard about him, and maybe somebody's got a cousin who lives in the village next door, and all of a sudden they hear about Jesus, and, and the word spreads, and they're like, hey, this guy's coming. Be ready for him. He's got these amazing things he can do. Listen to him. He might be able to heal you. There's all of this great stuff that's happened. And he is now arriving in his hometown in Nazareth. And the people have heard about him. And they're thrilled that he's come back. They're like, oh, we remember him. We remember him when he was just a little boy. He was Joseph's son. Now look what he's been able to do. This is our guy. This is the one that we raised. Guess what? If he's done all of these amazing things all over these other places, when he's been elsewhere, just imagine what he can do for us us. The people think that Jesus is their lottery ticket, that he's the one who can overcome that circle of concern. Like Jesus might be able to just wipe that whole circle of concern out. Like he's their rainmaker. He's going to be the one who will send the rain and the crops will flourish. He'll make them rich and powerful. He can be this ultimate healer so nobody will be sick again. Yet when Jesus is actually confronted with those expectations, is that what he does? 
No, as he teaches them, he's like, you know, I, I'm not just here for you. But I'm here for everyone. I'm here for the foreigner. I'm here for the neighbor. I'm here for the enemy, the one that you don't like. I'm here for them too. And how well does that go over? Hint, not well. What happened when the people have their expectations completely surprised? What do the people in Jesus' hometown do when Jesus tells them he's not here for just them? They want to throw him off of a cliff. Like, let's let that sink in a little bit. Like, they're ready to kill him on the spot. Forget crucifying him on the cross. It almost ended right here. They drive him out of town. They want to throw him off a cliff. They want to say, Jesus, you aren't what we expected. It's too bad they didn't have an anger management course that they could have taken before he showed up to town. You know, theologian Fred Craddock said, Jesus doesn't go somewhere else Because he's rejected in Nazareth, in his hometown. He's rejected in Nazareth because he's been somewhere else. You know, to to think about like the the feedback that a preschooler might receive when they go back home and have a note written on a sheet of paper. Uh, The people of Nazareth don't share well with others. Jesus slips through the midst. Back on his way. He disappears. And he moves to his next stop. And literally the first thing in Luke's gospel that happens after he's gone, he heals somebody. It's like that ministry doesn't stop just because he's had this setback. His circle of influence is going to keep growing because he's made that choice to leave the place that was trying to crash down on him. He had the ability to expand his circle of influence by leaving the place that was trying to stop his ministry. Now, here's the thing. Before we start like patting ourselves on the back and saying, well, good job for us. I mean, at least we aren't like the awful people of Nazareth. I think it's pretty important for us to recognize something pretty important. We aren't that much different. We reject Jesus all the time. Like, we really do. Like, I think probably more often than we care to admit with the choices that we make, with the things that we do, with the things that we think. Let's be honest. We want Jesus to do things just for us. We're selfish people. We want Jesus to be only for us. We want Jesus to believe the way that we believe, to vote the way that we vote, to to act the way that we act. And the reality is, we think Jesus is created in our our image. Not that Jesus came into this world because we'd messed up that perfect image that God created. And so what happens? What happens when we face the temptation to throw our neighbor off the cliff? When we reject those neighbors, Christians, non-Christians, the ones who don't believe the same way that we do, what do we do? We start wondering, well, how how could God love them? Why would God be here for them too. And the reality is when we try to throw off those neighbors, when we throw them off the cliff in our heads, it's really no better than trying to throw Jesus off the cliff ourselves. We can't control what others think, do, or say. But as a body of Christ, we definitely aren't the same. But what we can control is how we respond to a world full of people of differences all created by our loving God. So think about it. How can we create a habit? Now, trust me, those habits might be really hard. How can we create a habit of loving our neighbor instead of speaking ill behind their back? How can we lift up that habit of building our neighbors up instead of hurling them off the cliff? We can't control the weather, but here's an image that I think you're all going to relate to. Remember, the goal in our lives is not to be the king of the mountain. The goal, as Christ has done it, is for us to share that view. Share that view with those around us. To be able to pull each other up. To know that the circle of influence that each and every one of us has, that Jesus is at the center of that. And that is the most important habit for all of us to follow. Amen. Thank you for being the teammates 
on this journey. Thank you for the ministry that you do and for you at home, for all of the ways that you've lifted each other up, how you pray for each other in times of, of sorrows and darkness and celebrate with each other in the times of joy, how you constantly are looking for ways to be able to help support our neighbor, to love our neighbor, those that we know and those that we don't. Know those who are from our hometown and those who are around the world. We are truly the body of Christ and we're trying to live that out knowing that it's Christ that, that, that is at the center. So we thank you for all of the ways that you give and all of the ways that you support each other. As we turn it over to the band in our musical offering.
Amen. Thank you. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. I invite you to lift up your prayers of joy or celebration as we pray together. God, whose love is poured out in abundance, hear these prayers of our hearts and those spoken aloud. For Don and Sue Hine. For peace for Doc Orn in his final days. Prayers for Rob and Scott. Pray for healing and wholeness for Britta, Opal, Milton, Cody, and Dylan. Comfort for the Leasinger family. Give us strength for the journey, God, and open hearts to hear your voice. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We now join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to raise your hand in blessing and in turn with love towards someone as we say these words together. May the Lord bless you and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives are released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church we pray revive this earth Cha-cha! 
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.